Let's talk about the specifics of the diet you recommend for people. The nuance is the most important, and the devil is in the details. So a low-carb diet, like people who are walking into my office are not the healthiest of people that you would come across. I mean, it, these are not people who are young individuals who have fairly decent metabolic health and with a combination of a low-carb diet, intermittent or time-restricted feeding and exercise, they can rapidly get transitioned to a good health. These people are obese. These people have very high insulin levels. These people have very high triglycerides. Uh, these people are hypertensive. They have some heart disease. Some of these people are on very high levels of insulin. And it is irresponsible for somebody like me to just give them a blanket statement that says, hey, go on a low-carb diet, go on intermittent fasting, go on exercise, and you'll be fine. Because these people already have very high triglyceride levels. And on top of those high triglyceride levels, you are asking them to eat a lot of fat. And when they eat fat, the fat is going to remain in the bloodstream. It's not going to be packed into the fat cells because the fat cells are already overstuffed. So the triglyceride levels are going to go even higher in these individuals. And that extra fat is going to try to find a place to park itself. And it'll park itself in the liver, in the pancreas, or in the blood vessels, creating more plaque that can, in my clinical expertise, I think will put them at higher risk of getting cardiac events. So an initial diet for somebody who is metabolically unhealthy who has high triglyceride levels, who's got high insulin levels, who's got low HDL levels, should focus primarily on intermittent fasting, exercise, and the diet should be what I call as a lean, low-carb diet. A diet that is low not only in carbs, but relatively low to moderate in fat. Because you first want to burn the fat that you have accumulated in your bloodstream, empty your fat cells to some degree before you can eat fat with impunity. Because if I take somebody who is healthy, who is young, who is not metabolically unhealthy, the fat that they eat will get rapidly packed into the fat cells or will be burned for energy, and very little fat will be left in the bloodstream. So until that situation is obtained in my patients, I prescribe them a lean, low-carb diet. And in some indiv individuals, it might be as short a period as a few months, a month, two months, and some people it might be three to six months before they gain metabolic health. What we ought to remember is that people don't become metabolically unhealthy overnight. It takes them several decades of poor habits to get there. And they're not going to become metabolically healthy overnight by changing their diet the traditional low-carb way either. So in my opinion, a diet has to be individualized. It just cannot, one blanket diet would not serve everybody. This is really important. So this could be up to six months. We want to lower the carbs, lower the fat. So obviously it's going to be a high protein diet. You mentioned intermittent fasting and exercise. How do we know as a person's going through that period that can be up to half a year, say, and they're slowly getting more metabolically healthy, how are you determining that when they can make changes to more of a maintenance diet and lifestyle? Is it objective testing or is it just, you know, something more subjective? How do you go about doing that? Uh, it's objective testing. So a person would start feeling better. Their blood pressure starts dropping. They start losing weight. 
they start feeling better. They come back, you do blood work on them, you notice that their triglyceride levels have dropped from 300s to like 90s or low 100s. You notice that their HDL has gone up from like 34 to 55. You notice that their insulin levels have fallen from 25, 30 to about like 10, 7 to 10. You notice that their blood sugar levels have improved. You also notice that their LDL levels have gone up. So you're seeing all these laboratory parameters along with some clinical factors, blood pressure, weight, how they feel. So then you can say, hey, uh, Mr. John Doe, uh, Mr. Smith, you're ready now. You can start increasing your fat. Now, it also is very important to point out that it is um, difficult to be on a lean, low-carb diet. It's not a pleasant sensation. It's not a pleasant feeling. And there are many people who doubt that. In fact, I have gotten a lot of hate mail uh, for promoting a lean, low-carb diet because people say that fat is one of the most satiating aspects of your diet, that when you eat fat, you tend to eat less, and so don't take that away from individuals. And there can be an element of truth to that for the normal person. But I'm completely convinced that these people who are sending me hate mail do not know the kind of patients that I deal with. And that there is a variation amongst us that people who are wanting to improve their health are not just young individuals with fairly decent metabolic health. There are many middle-aged and older people with heart disease and diabetes and obesity who are trying to improve their health. And to these people, you're saying, hey, I want you to be on a lean, low-carb diet. So let's kind of dive into the minutiae of it. So let's say we tell people, hey, you can have about 50 grams of carbs. So 50 grams of carbs, you know, from whatever, cauliflower, cabbage, whatever their complex carb source is, that'll give them 200 calories because every carb has four kilocalories, 50 times four, 200. Let's say that they can have even up to 200 grams of protein. You know, you generally say that you can have about two grams per kilogram body weight. So let's say you are 80 kilograms. I mean, most of these people are heavy, 80, 90 kilograms. So let's say they take in 200 grams of protein. So 200 times four um, is uh, 800 calories. So they've gotten a thousand calories so far. Let's say we tell them, okay, you can eat as much as 100 grams of fat because you can't eat protein alone. You know, eating protein alone would be like eating cardboard. You would have to have some fat. So let's say 200 grams of car, uh, a fat in it. So 200, now fat has eight, eight kilocalories. So let's say double. So that's, you know, seven to eight. So you would say that from that uh, 200, uh, uh, 200 times, uh, 100 times 8, you're getting 18, 800 calories. So you're eating a diet that is 1,800 calories, which would be a caloric deficit diet. In other words, you're not even replacing all the calories that you're burning. And that is a good reasons for ex giving them that kind of a diet because the remainder of the calories are coming from burning your stored fat, from your endogenous fat. It's not a sustainable diet long term, but it's a diet that people can sustain for three to six months until they get metabolically healthy. So you got to sit down and explain all of these to the individuals and it's difficult. It's also important for a practitioner to recognize that it's one thing to know that several people, like I, you know, if I get 100 patients, probably about 10 to 15 of them 
would follow your advice, would become metabolically healthy, lose weight, and do well. But the vast majority, some of them try their best. I would say 50% would try their best, but would essentially fail because even though they know in their mind what is the right thing to do, there is a significant failure to implement it. And that is one aspect that physicians don't understand. That healthcare workers and uh, people who are working in the area of metabolic health, weight loss, fail to understand that knowledge is one thing, but implementation of that knowledge may be extremely difficult. And that you need to give these people the tools, not only of what is right, but how to implement it. This right here is my favorite protein powder, the 100% grass-fed bone broth protein from Paleo Valley. It comes in three flavors, unflavored chocolate and vanilla, the chocolate and vanilla you can just mix with water, they taste incredible just like that. And I like to take the unflavored, scoop it in my black coffee, mix it in, I barely taste it, but I'm getting that collagen and protein boost. These protein powders have been third party tested for over 40 different herbicides and pesticides. They've come back negative. There's no chemicals or solvents used in the processing, just water. As a viewer of the show, click the link in the description to save 15% off this protein today. Again, this is my favorite protein. I know you're going to love it. And what would you say to somebody in that boat? Because you've worked with people, a lot of people, I assume. How do you help somebody cross that bridge? They have the information, but they're having trouble implementing. Those are good questions. And that would be a subject of another two-hour podcast. But we can try to kind of touch on some of those. Um. I try to learn newer and newer things to not only help myself, my patients, and my colleagues. And some of the things that I am learning is how the reward center in our brain works, because we are currently living in the world of overwhelming abundance. We are being constantly bombarded when we go any place, even into our own kitchen, of highly palatable, engineered food that is creating high levels of dopamine in us through the reward center for us to get tempted to consuming these foods in excess. So, in the words of somebody that I enjoy reading, we are living in a Tantalian world. A Tantalian world is the world of Tantalus. I don't know if people know who Tantalus was, but Tantalus was a Greek god. And this Greek god did some very evil things. So the higher gods punished him to the world of Tantalus, in which he was in a, in a very beautiful stream with a lot of fruits and other things with an easy reach, but he could never reach them completely. So that's where the word tantalizing comes from. So humans, we have created a Tantalian world for us. Whenever you, whenever you walk into a supermarket, whenever you walk into a bakery, whenever you go outside, you're constantly being bombarded by these cues of highly palatable engineered food to make your dopamine system go into high gear and want you to consume these things. Would you agree with that? Yes, for sure. So the challenge for us would be to explain to them how the reward center of the brain works and that many people confuse dopamine as a neurotransmitter of pleasure. They say high levels of dopamine equate to pleasure. 
but that is one of the essential myths and a uh, wrong concept that has been propagated that has not been corrected and, it, and it's our responsibility to correct dopamine is not a pleasure substance it's not a pleasure neurotransmitter dopamine is a neurotransmitter that increases wanting it increases desire it increases motivation because our brain the reward center of our brain was designed when we were several thousand years ago when we were living on the savanna when we needed to high have high levels of motivation high levels of dopamine in order to get that reward that would occasionally happen fruits would be hyper seasonal hyper local obtaining food was not that easy now fast forward into the modern world something that was highly adaptive and helped us survive is now a source of metabolic ill health and obesity so there is a dissociation if if i were to tell you that biology does not care whether you have pleasure or no at all in life all biology cares is that you have high drive and high motivation because that's needed for survival of species if you were back in the savanna and when you saw an animal that you could consume kill and consume for food if you didn't have high energy levels you would the species would not persist so our biology is designed for us to have a high want and a high desire but that there is an uncoupling between our desire and the pleasure we derive from food so if we can train people saying that when you're seeing these substances and they are jacking up your dopamine levels they are creating a strong want and a strong desire can you understand that that doesn't consuming those is not equivalent to deriving pleasure and satisfaction from them so we not only have to be healthcare workers and individuals who care about our own health in terms of knowing what is the right thing to do but we also need to find out why we fail to do it what is our neurobiology that prevents us from doing the right things all right so pretend i'm your patient metabolically unhealthy and you're telling me about this diet that i need to be on for 6 months or up to 6 months low carb high protein low fat take me through what a typical day might look like because you've gotten into it but i want to know like specific foods that somebody might be eating excellent so um uh let's uh, start out with uh, with the day we are imbued we, we have biology that gives you the lowest levels of temptation the lowest levels of dopamine and the highest level of will power or control over our decisions early in the morning because while we have this dopamine reward system that is giving us all these temptations evolution has also given us what is called the prefront prefrontal cortex the prefrontal cortex can be thought of as our will power as our agency as our executive function as our awareness and the prefrontal cortex works best when you have slept well you know when you are well rested when you're not distracted so your level of will power is highest in the morning so i tell people you get up in the morning your liver is already getting ready through gluconeogenesis to supply you a meal and you can do fasting 
you know, it'll be very easy for you to continue the overnight fast by not eating breakfast. If you can add an element of exercise at that point, and this exercise should be low intensity exercise. So what do I what do I mean by low intensity? So let's say it should be zone two. Now zone two exercise is where while you're exercising, you're predominantly fat burning. You're not consuming carb resources. Can we define zone two a little bit better? Yes, we can. So you take 180 minus age. You know, this is a pretty easy number. So like, let's say somebody 50 years of age, 40 years of age. Their exercise should be at 180 minus 40. So they have to have a heart rate below 140 when they exercise. If you're 60 years, it should be below 120. So you are in the fat burning zone. And after you finish exercise, if you can hold off on eating, you will further increase your fat burning, you will further drop your triglycerides, you'll further empty your fat cells. Your first meal of the day should be at around lunch, noon to one o'clock. Make it a predominantly animal-based food that is low in fat, low in carbs. How do you do that? How do you get animal-based food? What, what does that mean when you say animal-based food? So let's say you can eat beef, lamb, chicken, but it should be cooked in such a way that you can take the fat out of it. One of the ways to do that is to cook it in an Instapot or a slow cooker. You leave it after you cook for a little while, the fat floats to the top. You can skim off the fat. You're left with lean food. You can also cook it in an air fryer. You know, the fat will dribble down. You will be with a low fat. You can also buy low, uh, low uh, lean cuts of meat, but that becomes very expensive. You can have above ground vegetables like cabbage, cauliflower, okra. And if you don't have kidney stones um, or you don't have any problems with oxalates, you can have spinach, broccoli, and such. So that gives you your lunch. Now, your dinner should be variations of the same, and it should be at about 6 o'clock, and you should do no snacking. You can have water. You can have water with salt. I generally don't recommend caffeine to these individuals. Now, I used to be big on caffeine. I would say caffeine mobilizes fat. It promotes fat burning. And that's true in an individual who is metabolically healthy. So if you're metabolically healthy, you can consume caffeine early in the morning up until 10 o'clock in the morning because after 10, I don't like caffeine. It disrupts with your sleep. So have caffeine until 10 for metabolically healthy people, for obese, insulin resistant, high triglyceride patients try to avoid caffeine. Because what caffeine does is that it goes and tells the fat cells to put fat into the bloodstream. You don't want, it, you don't want to do that when you already have too high a level of triglycerides. You're trying to reduce the triglycerides and instead of reducing the triglycerides, you're going to add more fat and it's going to worsen the situation. Do that for about three months. Let's come back, redo your blood work, take a look at your blood pressure, your weight, see how you feel. See where you are in terms of your metabolic health so that we can individualize your diet further. Now, if you're following this diet, you cannot eat more than 1,500 to 1,800 calories. So it's going to be what is called a protein-sparing modified fast. The remainder of the caloric, caloric expenditure for you is coming from your endogenous fat sources. Okay, so we've gone over exactly what that diet looks like now. You mentioned the fasting, the zone two exercise. Are those just during that initial period of time that somebody's becoming metabolically healthy? And then what does it look like down the line. Let's talk about diet, exercise, and fasting. Say six months down the line, the person's metabolically healthy. 
what will it look like now? So at that point, uh, I would have no restrictions on the amount of fat that they are eating. And depending on their caloric expenditure, depending on their physical activity, um, fasting may or time-restricted feeding may or may not be required. In my mind, time-restricted feeding is required for most individuals. Now, let's say you come across a young person in their 30s who's a cyclist who's putting in about 15 to 20 hours of cycling per week. And you go ahead and tell him that, hey, I want you to fast. That's going to be unrealistic. On the other hand, you have to come across people who are working in an office, who exercise maybe four to seven hours per week. For them, time-restricted feeding in which they give 18-hour interval without food is perhaps a necessary uh, byproduct of uh, necessary for metabolic health. So at this time, we remove the fat restriction. We remove the restriction for caffeine. I think caffeine should still stop at 10 o'clock because I think sleep is very important. Caffeine has a six-hour half-life. If you have consumed a cup of coffee at noon, 25% of that caffeine is still there at midnight, and it's going to disrupt the quality of your sleep. So I would want it before 10 so that you have metabolized the caffeine. But I remove the restrictions for fat. and in some individuals who are metabolically very healthy, who are young, who have low insulin levels, who have low A1C, who have normal triglycerides, I think that these individuals should even consider days in which they consume carbs to spike up their insulin levels. Because insulin is not a bad player, you know, it, it depends on the context. Insulin is there for a reason. It's uh, something that increases muscle mass. So you want these people to maintain their muscle mass. And spiking the insulin level activates mTOR, activates new protein synthesis. And so it's no reason to take away that insulin spike that will facilitate all of this in people who are young and metabolically healthy for them to achieve optimal health. Okay, what about older and metabolically healthy? Somebody in their 50s, 60s, is this still applicable? I think so. I got, people are living longer, healthier. Uh, there are master athletes that put in um, 8 to 12 hours of exercise per week or even longer. Um, it's important for them to maintain muscle mass because one of the reasons why um, one of the re one of the main factors that keeps you healthier is muscle mass. The more muscle mass you have, the better you can dispose of the sugar after the meal, the glucose after the meal that you're eating. Uh, it maintains your uh, uh, maintains your mobility. And mobility is a very important aspect of health as you grow older. So if there are ways in which you can promote and protect and preserve and maybe even improve your muscle mass as you're aging, um, you should not consider occasional insulin spikes maybe two, three times a week in extremely healthy individuals as a necessary method to keep your muscle mass. Okay. And then in between those spikes, let's talk about where they are on the carb spectrum. Because there's, you know, big wide range there from carnivore, no carbs or very little carbs in meat to ketogenic to low carb. How low carb do you recommend? So um, let's give a specific example. That way people would know what we are uh, referring to. So let's say you have a 60 year old, year old individual who is doing optimal exercise. So it's important to be, for me to say what optimal exercise is because optimal exercise is one in which 
you're exercising in such a way that you're not increasing allostatic hormones like cortisol, epinephrine, and creating a detriment to your body. So how do you know you are an optimal exercise? I mean, there are several ways to know it. Perhaps the best way to know it is to look at your resting heart rate, to look at your heart rate variability, because heart rate variability and resting heart rate are surrogate markers of how rested you are. And if you're well rested, then you know that your stress hormone levels are lower. So if you're doing optimal exercise, and the exercise is like, let's say, upwards of 10, 15 hours. If these individuals come in and I look at their metabolic profile and I see that their triglycerides are less than 100, their HDL cholesterol is greater than 60, 55, 60, they have normal blood sugars, they have very low insulin levels, and they tell me, Doc, I want to eat 100 grams of carbs a day. I'd say, fine. There's no reason for you to go to 50 grams. They come and tell me that on Saturday and Sunday, I go out with a group of friends and I do high intensity training and I need more carbs. So I would need to eat 200, even 250 grams of carbs on those days. I'd say, fine. On the other hand, if you're somebody who is just doing 30 minutes on an elliptical, doing like an hour of walking, let's say that would be probably about three and a half miles, going to office to work and come back. And you have similar blood work like the previous individual. And I would say, hey, you probably need to be at about 50 grams of carbs per day. And that maybe one day or so a week, when you're going to be more physically active, you can have an insulin spike and go up to 100, 150, 200 grams of carbs. But you not need to limit these events to as minimal as possible. So what many people don't realize is that nutrition is an individualized prescription. It's not like one size fits all. No, I agree. We're just trying to get that template from you and then people need to tailor that to their lifestyle and, and test different things and see what works for them. I think that my biggest challenge these days is not, not that people don't have the knowledge of what's right. The biggest challenge is how do we implement that? How do I give people additional tools to figure out how to implement it the best? And for that, you have to move out of the nutritional science and go more into psychology and how our modern world interacts with our brain and come up with novel and new solutions. Well, you got into that dopamine piece earlier. Is there more in that realm you want to share to get people off on the right foot? Sure. I think that we can talk about the... Uh, the dopamine system being something that gives you a drive. And that's important. A drive is very important. In other words, somebody with a robust dopamine system is necessary for health and happiness. Because you don't want to go and take drugs, if there were such drugs, to remove all dopamine from your system. Now, people have tried that. So there are certain brain injuries you get in which it damages all the dopamine system in your brain. Now these people you would think are free of desires and free of wants, so they leave, lead a blissful life. But it's completely the opposite because these people derive no pleasure out of anything. They don't have any drive. You put sugar in their mouth, they will enjoy it but they will not move a few steps to obtain that sugar. So in other words, they have no motivation, no, no drive. They have what is called anhedonia, lack, complete lack of pleasure. So people who have a very high drive system, they should say, hey, this is good. 
you know, the drive system is important because it's important for my happiness. I just need to point that drive system in the right direction so that it aligns with what I need to do to be healthy. And on top of that, we need to give people information on how to improve the prefrontal cortex functioning. So the prefrontal cortex is something that will help you curb temptations, that will help you with agency, with executive planning, with awareness. So how can you make the prefrontal cortex work better? I would assume sleep is a piece of it. Sleep is a piece of it. Would you believe that exercise is a piece of it? Yeah, I would say meditation, maybe. Meditation also. So, uh, and also remember that whenever you are distracted, like for example, if I am watching something, I'm involved in media, my brain is distracted, my prefrontal cortex is not working good, I will make all the wrong decisions with food choices and stuff like that. So you ought to recognize, like we talked about four factors, sleep, exercise, meditation, and distraction. So you want to arm these people with all these resources, not just resources with regards to what is right to eat, but how the reward center works. You also need to tell them about certain very basic facts um, of human biology, such as ghrelin, how it works, and how you can ignore ghrelin, because ghrelin is a hunger hormone. The sight, the thought of food will make your ghrelin levels go up, would make you want to eat. But if you ignore ghrelin for about five to 10 minutes, the ghrelin levels automatically go down. So the temptation will go away if you can wait for five to 10 minutes. The very act of eating increases ghrelin levels. And you would expect that as you start eating, the ghrelin levels should come down rapidly. But they don't come down rapidly. They don't come down for about an hour and a half for 90 minutes. Imagine the amount of food you can consume in 90 minutes. A lot. Oh, yeah. A lot, right? So you need to give people the tools saying that, hey, I want you to stop eating when you are about when you feel like you're about 70% full. And then tell yourself that I'm going to consume more if I'm still hungry after 30 minutes of not eating. Because one of the things that increases your appetite the most, the hunger the most, is the is the act of eating. I mean, you would have a full stomach. Or several of my patients tell me, and I've noticed that in myself, my stomach is full, but I still have this desire to eat more. Now, why do I have that desire to eat more? Is that because my dopamine system is very active, my reward system is very active, and there is a dissociation between reward and pleasure? Am I not recognizing the decoupling between the two? Is that because my ghrelin levels are telling my brain to eat? They have not gone down yet. Would waiting for about half an hour be beneficial for me? And if I wait for half an hour, I come back and say, actually, I still feel uncomfortable. I wonder why I wanted to eat more. As you share that, I think a piece of it, at least, is the type of food. I know for me, if it's like steak and broccoli in front of me versus like a bowl of chips, I can shut it down and push it aside if it's real food versus like a processed carb. That brings about a very important point. This is what is called intermittent positive reinforcement. So I'm sure you have heard about that. So intermittent positive reinforcement was first introduced by B.F. Skinner. So you had the Skinner pigeons and there was a lever, and when the uh, pigeon pressed a lever, they would get a pellet to eat. And every time they pressed the lever, 
if they would get a pellet to eat, the amount of reinforcement was not as high. But if it was variable, sometimes they press, they would get it. At another time, they press, they would not get it. The amount of dopamine release, now Skinner did not do that, but this neurochemistry got put on later, is that if there is intermittent positive reinforcement, then the number of times you would seek that reward would be much higher because dopamine levels go about twice as much as with a predictable reward. If you make a reward unpredictable, the amount of dopamine levels would be two times as high in your brain as with a predictable reward. Bring that back to food. You just talked about steak and broccoli. Not reinforcing a lot at all. You talk about engineered food like chips. They're highly reinforcing because they give you an intermittent positive reward. You know, you, you look into the engineering behind food, you would understand that why you would consume more a bag of chips. Of course, uh, nature designed you to value a bag of chips a lot more than meat because a bag of chips like fruit or carbs was hyper seasonal and hyper local. So the, a lot higher value was placed for that food by evolution. So these are some things that we don't recognize. And if somebody is armed with all of this information, and I hope as the new generation comes along, because they're dealing with many more challenges than we have in terms of distractions, in terms of sleep, and they are a lot more susceptible to these modern diseases than perhaps my generation was, it is not just essential for these children or the next generation to learn about basic facts of nutrition, but facts about biology of how hunger is, uh, the pleasure centers of the brain, and all the other stuff that we talked about. If you enjoyed that clip, press here for the full episode. I'll see you over there. And people are getting more comfortable in saying that a high LDL cholesterol in the setting of metabolic health is not something that needs to...